at the top this morning, <clears throat> one of the uh, key areas within the whole insights industry is healthcare. Uh, healthcare, as everybody is aware, is sort of the monster that is eating the economy these days. Uh, healthcare eat, uh, consumes about 18% of, of, of US GDP. Uh, and on a dollar basis, when we compare ourselves to other, con other countries, uh, we're spending about tw uh, uh, twice as much uh, on a per capita as any other country in the OECD. But that would not be such a sore point if outcomes from all that spending uh, anywhere came anywhere close to the to uh, to the dollars that were that 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 were laying out for this. However, that's not the case. When you look at U.S. health outcomes um, compared not just to the OECD but even to uh, less developed countries, we are often in the middle of the pack or we are trailing behind many other countries. So, not that insights are going to cure that entire phenomenon, but nonetheless, it, it, I think it's worthwhile trying to see what, um, what impact perhaps uh, better insights can, uh, can contribute to, uh, to closing that gap. So, Ken Carpe, who I, who I introduced earlier, who, is, who heads up um, the healthcare, marketing services, and media practice at ODP, and also works with us on when we have Healthcare Insights business. He's going to lead this panel. He'll introduce everybody. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for that introduction, Ken. You've already explained why we're here in terms of healthcare. Data insights is obviously important, but when you get into the healthcare market, there are all kinds of federal regulations, just like HIPAA and others, that complicate it. So we're going to focus on, in terms of data insights, it's not only reducing the cost of healthcare because of the rising GDP, but providing better patient outcomes. And that's where data insights is becoming all the more valuable. So I'm going to introduce our panel, um, and then we'll get right into questions. First of all, um, Chris Bradley, um, he founded an, a company called Mana Health. They started the company in 2013 when they created a patient portal with the goal of helping patients to have access to their own health data and the, those records. Um, they were acquired by Comcast in 2018, and that acquisition was critical to the rollout of Comcast's emerging healthcare strategy. Um, and when I say healthcare and Comcast, people say, what? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, next to Chris is Jerry Fields. Jerry, your ears might have been burning a little bit previously. Uh, Jerry is CEO of Canner Health USA. Canner, as you've heard um, discussed today, specializes in consumer insights, which is really a critical element into the improved patient outcomes. And of course, as said, Canner, it's the research insight and consulting arm of WPP, and now has um, partnership um, investment with, with Bain. And we'll also talk maybe a little bit about that. Okay. Next to Jerry is Greg Hedges. Greg is vice president um, of emerging experiences for the RAIN agency, R-A-I-N. Um, RAIN focuses on helping clients to develop and fully implement voice across multiple verticals. Voice, think of Alexa, that's a voice application. Um, and how does that work in healthcare? So um, Greg will tell us about that and what the impact of that would be around patient outcomes and the complexity. And finally, last but certainly not least, is Gaurav Kapoor. Um, Gaurav asked some questions earlier today, so you've already heard his voice. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Neuristics. Neuristics involves heuristics. Heuristics is the, right, okay, you heard it right. <laughs> heuristics is the science of how humans use pre-programmed mental shortcuts to make over 95% of those decisions. Um, it's a really interesting area in healthcare, and we'll talk about that as well, okay? So let's get started. Let's start with you, Chris. Sure. Um, first of all, I read that both of your parents um, were physicians, and I'm curious, when you told them that you wanted to start this business, 
how did they react? You know, patient data, computers, what yeah. was their reaction? Uh, I would say they reacted poorly. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, family physicians, as you can imagine, when you say I'm starting a business and now I'm an entrepreneur, uh, it makes for some little awkward conversations around the Thanksgiving or, you know, Christmas table. It's like, so you're, you're unemployed? Is that what that is? <laughs> it's like, no, no. And of course, you know, now, now obviously it's, it's a different story, but it was an interesting transition from a family perspective to have, uh, you know, sort of like, it's not if you're going to do medicine, it's what kind of medicine to yeah. uh, do. And, and what was the idea for the business? How did you, what got you to this? So it was interesting. I, I felt like I was lucky that um, I grew up around the time that there's this massive transition to the digitization of medical records. And I heard how much, I mean, honestly, it was just not going well. It was not being used by the actual frontline physicians. So my family would come home and around the dinner table complain about how uh, these records were filled with information that they couldn't really use or make, uh, make anything valuable happen from. And so I think that set the seed early on um, and then you know, it sort of grew from there. And just give us an idea of, um, well, first of all, let me go back. You were acquired by Comcast right. in 2018. Why that decision to do, to do that? Yeah, so I mean, it might sound strange in, in the beginning, but when you look at what we were doing at Mana Health, it was all about creating infrastructure to unlock these data sets in a responsible and effective way to improve healthcare. So we were fundamentally an infrastructure company. And of course, I didn't start out thinking that was gonna be the case, but when you get into it, you realize a lot of these problems are extremely complicated infrastructure problems uh, and sort of systemic issues. And so when you look at what Comcast was built around, and obviously now it's a massive company, but the origins of it are also in an infrastructure, in cable, in telecommunications infrastructure. So when we were looking at potential acquirers, uh, we saw you know, a fellow, obviously, much larger, much more mature company that aligned with our philosophy that for this to work, you're going to need to create a tide that raises all boats, uh, and it's an infrastructure play. And so there was a lot of you know, affinity there. So um, give us an, an example. Mana Health, what exactly, what's the end user get from you? Sure. Like, how do, how do your customers use it, and how do you make money from sure. doing that? So yeah, so, and I, I'll be honest, as a startup, we iterated on this a lot, um, is trying to figure out, you know, we start out thinking, oh, we'll just have a visual access for patients to get their information from these medical record systems, and so immediately that'll be valuable. The patients, mm -hmm. all of us will be able to see that data. And then you run into a brick wall of being able to actually make any sense of this information, unify it. Um, as many of you probably know, you go to eight different hospitals, you'll have eight different versions of your re record. You won't have a unified identifier. So you start seeing it's this sort of morass, this um, nested technological and incentive problem. And so we had to navigate that. So we started out as a patient access company, and we qu quickly morphed into uh, infrastructure as a service. So imagine if you are even a Google, right, um, or some kind of machine learning company, you want to do uh, valuable, you know, exciting things with that data. You don't want to spend 99% of your time figuring out how to actually get it, clean it, unify it, structure it, harmonize it, you know, navigate 16 different types of code sets. And so we did that on behalf of the, of the clients. Uh, and so it was a SaaS company. You know, fully scalable cloud. We had all the buzzwords at the right Got time. It. You know. Okay, so we want to come back and talk more about Comcast, but let's go down. So, um, Jerry Cantar, um, you had a big announcement a few months ago with um, Komodo Health. Right. Can you tell us about that? Why that announcement and why it's um, so important? You bet. I, I would be happy to, and I'll try to tie it into what we've been talking about this morning. So, Cantar has some proprietary assets, or you know, first. Uh, first grade assets, then uh, in the form of patient reported outcomes. So we collect on a global basis the, the largest survey of what people say about their health, which conditions do they have, um, their burden of illness, how many times they go to the hospital, a lot of information. We have a lot of socio-demographic information uh, on the patients as well. And, and I would say that's a traditional business that we've had for a while. And then the question really becomes, as you look forward in health, and you think about cost, and you think about value proposition or return on investment, what if we took that information and paired it with the EHR data that we could get through Komodo, as the well as the claims? Electronic health records. Electronic health records, and, and the claims associated with that in a de-identified way, would, would the client base have more confidence that what people say is exactly what matches the medical record, and how do you know, and can you predict that? Um, what, what a response would be and, and what to do about it. So these were questions that we had. So we, we made the announcement with Komodo, uh, Komodo and then we, we immediately picked a few disease areas 
to focus and drill down upon. So we chose diabetes first and, and ask ourselves the questions. When, when you ask a consumer, do you know what your blood level is? Can you do this? Uh, and, and they gave us the, you know, we had that information, so it was already accessible. What we learned is that it did match pretty closely with what was in the medical record. And so you, you, the hypothesis was, uh, huh. was validated. And then, but we have an activation scale that we ask about with patients. So what we also learned was that you actually can predict which patients are going to know how their health is to a higher degree based upon a different set of questions. So it became really fascinating to see that for groups who are assuming financial risk, we can help them predict an outcome and identify who's most likely to, to have a positive effect based upon their treatment. So, and we will publish this type of information. Kind of the side note, what, what we wouldn't publish, if you ask that same group of patients their weight, they do not know that <laughs> quite as well. So, or they're just lying. Exactly. <laughs> so. But they want to be. Exactly. <laughs> So um, with that data, what, what, um, one of the earlier panels was talking about whether you can just provide this data or whether you need to have services to also do that. I know that's one of the benefits that Cantor has previously. How does that work in that? Yeah, context? so um, when Will was talking about that, I, I wholeheartedly agree. You have to have both because I think, you know, we've seen so many times you can take data sets and we're dealing with uh, on the scientific sides of the organizations. You can have two groups look at the exact same data set and draw different conclusions. So it's not really just about the data. A lot of times it's confidence. And, and also then how do you take that information within their environments and the client environments and assimilate that all the way through and actually help them move the, the agenda through. So I, I, it would be nice if we could be so technically advanced and the answer is just self-evident and it's there. But I, I, not the data or the insights alone, but the, there's, it's more complex than that. Oh, okay, so yeah. we'll come back to that in, in a minute. So Greg, um, I was describing to someone earlier, you know, the RAIN agency and what you do, and they said, really, like Alexa? So um, explain your agency and the clients that come to you and some of the, um, uh, give us an example, if you could, of a solution in the, in the healthcare. Because your, your agency works not just in healthcare, you work across multiple disciplines. But within healthcare, could you give us an example of, of where you're doing this? Sure. Uh, so we have a little background on us. We are a voice-focused digital agency. Uh, we work across verticals. So as you mentioned, uh, healthcare is one of them. We work with entertainment, CPG, uh, financial services. So across the board, um, finding ways to bring voice technology into uh, the mix, regardless of what department or what area it may sit in, uh, for the brands that we work with. Um, and a lot of people think of voice, and you hear uh, voice and think of Alexa, or you're reminded of that as, as you're kind of getting familiar with it. But voice, if we think about it from a capital V standpoint, kind of uh, crosses the spectrum. So there's the smart speakers that we often think of first. But there's things like voice search, so the ability for someone to go into Google or talk to Siri or talk to any other number of devices and ask a question and find an answer, very highly intent-driven um, queries. Uh, there's also integration into apps and websites, and it really crosses the spectrum. There's integration into devices, so a lot of people can talk to their uh, refrigerators or uh, their cars or any other number of uh, devices that exist out there. I tried that last night. And, <laughs> and, and I, what's amazing about it is uh, once you go and do it, a lot of people don't go back. I have kids that are one seven and one five, and they expect to be able to talk to everything. They change channels that way. They talk to Alexa and get answers. They talk to the refrigerator to find out. Order candy from Alexa. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it, happen <laughs> it happens more than you think, more than you'd like. Uh, but uh, the idea is, uh, that we help agencies, uh, our brands figure out where they should go, what's their roadmap, and what, and then go and execute on that. So we're full service in the sense that we design and build. Uh, and I mentioned before that we work in a variety of verticals, but specific to healthcare. Healthcare, since I've uh, been working with voice, has been the holy grail of voice. Uh, if you think about uh, it from a couple angles, I can explain why. One, uh, since we've worked with technology, any technology that we've had through the history of it, uh, it's always been something that we've had to adapt to. Uh, we've had to learn how to drive a car. We had to learn how to operate machines. We have to learn how to type on a keyboard or, or move a mouse around. But voice is inherently built around us. It's built for us to be able to speak to, understand us, and hopefully, if it's done right, uh, give us what we're looking for. 
So in that way, you know, that I think that's one very powerful reason why, especially for any industry, but in healthcare, that can be powerful. Two, um, a lot of industries so far in these early but maturing days of voice, uh, it's been additive. So in a, we worked with Starbucks to release a skill where you can order coffee, uh, adding a channel to which people can purchase through them. Uh, we've worked with different entertainment brands like the movie Dunkirk or uh, the TV show for Kung Fu Panda, another kind of stretch of their marketing channels. Um, and then we've worked with others like Unilever and Tide in order to be there where people are asking questions around stains and how people are interacting. But those additive areas in healthcare I see it as more transformative uh, because of the fact that it crosses so many different avenues, so patients, providers, um, and the full spectrum of everything in between, um, and the fact that uh, it actually, uh, we can build experiences around what matters and what's needed in the moment. So uh, for instance, uh, we've built experiences that range on the side of wellness. So we've worked with Pfizer and with Meredith, the content company, uh, in order to produce an experience where people can uh, manage and set and, and hear content related to their wellness goals, very specific, personalized uh, goals that they have, and manage that and, and hear content daily on uh, how they can move forward and towards those goals. Or we're working right now with uh, a partner of ours on a skill that'll be launched soon uh, related to LGS, so uh, Lennox Gestalt Syndrome. So uh, uh, early onset epilepsy, I guess, would be something that people might be more familiar with. But in a way that can help both those living with that, so children typically in that case, uh, or their caregivers uh, have uh, a better experience in terms of how they uh, operate their daily lives or just to provide better care. Mm. Um, and so it's interesting to think about, you know, those are some cases that we've worked with, but you see it everywhere from uh, being integrated into uh, hospital care. So uh, Cedar sinai has implemented voice into their hospitals, uh, into hospitals to uh, allow for access to nurses as well as entertainment in the room and kind of back to that experience uh, conversation from earlier, kind of give them that better experience. Even uh, there's an EMT company in uh, uh, Massachusetts that has released an experience uh, f that allows their clinicians to be able to get on the second access to uh, information that can help them uh, with the patients that they're. Okay, so I want to come back and ask you about sure. the data that's related to that. But let's um, let's go um, on our panel to Gaurav. Okay, explain to us um, heuristics and how the context within healthcare, what that, what that actually means. Could you give us some examples? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ken started this whole conversation with uh, health outcomes are not great in this country and even around the world. And you can boil that down to almost every stakeholder in the healthcare industry is misbehaving. Is misbehaving? Misbehaving. <laughs> they are not doing what they should be doing. And their behaviors can be, or their um, irrational behaviors can be explained by behavioral science. So there's a whole body of research. This gentleman here referred to Lake Bobagon effect. <laughs> he was, he's already uh, a behavioral scientist, I can tell. Um, basically, there's a whole science behind how human beings make decisions yeah. using mental shortcuts. The word heuristic just means shortcut. If you use a mental shortcut to make a decision, it becomes a decision heuristic. And over time, hundreds of heuristics and biases have been discovered to drive human decision making in many aspects of life. In healthcare, healthcare is probably as an industry has more stakeholders than any other industry, right? From physician, patient, payer, nurse, pharmacist, you can just go on and on. Every one of them is making decisions. And collectively, those decisions are shaping what the outcomes look like. And they're all using heuristics and biases to make decisions. So heuristics is literally the name says what we do. It's a new way to message to healthcare stakeholders using decision heuristic science. Um, so an example. Examples, examples. Um, the heuristic that won Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago, almost everybody here probably has read an article on it, loss aversion. But most people haven't internalized it, in, so I'll actually even make you do that right now, right here. <laughs> loss aversion means people do not want to lose what they have. They would pass on something better in life because the fear of losing what they have in their hands in the process of getting something better is not a, a, a risk or a trade-off they want to make. I can prove it to you, all of you have loss aversion right now. And here's how. I can predict almost everyone here your real passion in life is not your job. And if you were to walk away from your job, 
almost everybody, <laughs> almost everybody, right? If you were to walk away from your job right now and go do what makes you supremely happy, you would change as a human being. Yeah, possibly. If somehow or the other you were financially okay, would you do that? Probably not. How many people do you know who have spent their entire life or many, many years of their lives in jobs, in relationships, in whatever, because the risk of losing what they have in the process of getting something better was not worth the risk that they wanted so to So within the healthcare context, yeah. pick so a... So if you're a rheumatologist yeah. and you're treating a patient who has RA, rheumatoid arthritis, you have loss aversion. You don't want to lose the processes or the systems or the treatment algorithms that you have developed. So in walks in, um, pick any new RA drug that is trying to market itself. Now, the physician has their own loss aversion that they don't want to lose what they have built up in how they treat RA. So now the new brand is having a problem getting adoption. The patient has their own version of loss aversion. They don't want to lose their joint uh, function, et cetera, et cetera. That's one heuristic. If we're talking aversions only, let's do two more aversions so that you can internalize it. Ambiguity aversion, which basically means Simple rule of thumb, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. You use that rule of thumb all the time. You can even go to a restaurant, you wanna try something new, but you don't know what faro is on the, on the <laughs> uh, I'm not having that, I'll just stick with my steak and potatoes, right? <laughs> disappointment aversion, which basically means if you're doing something and you expect you might be disappointed, you won't try at all. Even though if you actually did it, and the improvement you got was less than what you expected, but it was still more than what you have, right? So if you wanna lose 20 pounds, but you think you're never going to, you don't even try at all, well, losing five pounds was better than not losing any, and, or actually gaining five pounds. So disappointment aversion is also a, 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 an example of a heuristic. So hundreds of heuristics have been discovered like that. Mm. Heuristic specializes in messaging using heuristic science. How do you talk to a person using heuristics, almost manipulating language to get their attention and then to move their, change their behavior? Okay, so Chris, what? how many patients in the US actually have access to their data? And is there evidence to show that patients having access to their data actually improves patient behavior and patient outcomes? Right, so I mean, I would say not enough is the shortest answer, like not enough people have access. And depending on who you ask and what their, uh, you know, I'd say hidden agenda is and what their incentives are, they may push one side of the story or the other. I think it's true that there's, there has been a massive adoption of medical record systems. I'd say about 90%, you know, roughly between um, inpatient, outpatient. Now people have these records, and each one has a government mandated, you know, patient access point. 90% of physicians have access or 90% of patients? I'm kind of blending. I think more okay. hospitals have digitized than uh, private practice. So I'd yeah. say roughly, you know, I don't know the latest statistics, but I'd say roughly between the two, most people have digitized. There's sort of stalwarts out there that are not digitizing the records. They've just refused. Um, and they will take whatever, you know, government hit they, they will have to. But, uh, but by and large, the problem isn't so much access. It's access in one place. So especially for those who need it most, people who are ill, people who are you know, so-called frequent flyers who have to go to multiple different specialists um, and have to travel, they will have eight, nine, 10, you know, 12 different patient portal logins with a piece of a record here, some pieces over there. Some of it's machine readable, some of it's just a PDF. Um, some have doctor's notes, some don't. Um, and so it's just a mess. So it's, it's a lot of and, problems. And when patients have access to the data, is, is the outcomes yeah, so I, I mean, I think we're at a point where it's hard to know, and so one of the arguments I would make is, what are better outcomes? So we have these, sense, th these sort of sets of government outlined um, bare minimum criteria for better outcomes, but the true power of the data, in my mind, uh, to get around some of these heuristics is, what is objectively good health? I think that's a much more interesting question. Um, we now have potentially access to millions of people's records and then there's a lot of you know, ifs and buts between that and the reality. But let's say for a second, privacy concerns aside, we are able to parse through uh, 200 million records in real time. That's more insight into the medical condition of humanity than we've ever had in the history of medicine, right? So what does it mean to be healthy? I don't think we've even started to scratch the surface of what we can do to define that, let alone how to get from 
unhealthy to healthy and, and what that would mean with that type of data. Okay, so if anybody has questions, please raise your hand. We're gonna keep, oh, we have a question here, okay. Go ahead. We have a microphone coming. Thanks. I, I have a joint question for Greg and Gaurav. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I agree that voice is the main way we communicate. That's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. But we're used to talking to other people, not machines. So how do you sort of overcome that, especially in terms of like the human behavior? And because you know people will feel dumb, they'll feel embarrassed to talk to a machine, and, and all that kind of thing. So it, so in some ways, there's almost a, a greater hurdle to communicating with the machine by voice than by a keyboard, even though it's artificial, because that's also what we're used to. I guess I'd kind of flip that around. I don't know that, I think if you asked several people, uh, they might say more to a machine than they would another person. <laughs> uh, because of the fact that it's more private, uh, especially again in these healthcare uh, related settings, you may be more willing to discuss a condition that you're having uh, to an Alexa or some other application, depending on where it is, than you would to your wife or husband or whomever it may be. So. Um, I don't know, I guess, I, I don't know that that is totally something that is the, is the case. Um, and I think because of that, there's just a, a wealth of opportunity there to provide people access to their records and give them an opportunity to do something with that. Uh, not only them, but their providers as well, so that when they go into uh, a healthcare setting, they're able to uh, get better care, earlier care, maybe preventative care, that because of what the technology can enable, for instance, uh, as it gets stronger, uh, the ability to understand sentiment, tone, uh, hear things in your speech pattern that might indicate a health condition. Uh, and so again, I think that there are, that's where the opportunities really uh, align with where things can shift for even people that may be more averse to speaking to a machine uh, because the value will be demonstrated as to what it can, what can provide and therefore they'll increasingly become more familiar with it and accept it. See, I'm, I'm thinking about it from the opposite side. If if we want to change patient behavior, let's say, and there are many tools available to tr you can try. You can change the rules or guidelines. You can incent or disincent them. But one of the tools, at least the one we are uh, uh, you know, focusing a lot on, is messaging. So if I message to you in a way that I get your attention and I change your behavior or try to change your behavior, the one thing that's interesting is human voice carries emotion. Right? In, in Israel, they even use this technology to actually detect if people are lying or not. They can literally map actual emotions as you're speaking. Um, as AI evolves, will AI voice carry emotion also? Or, and maybe it's not even a will, it's like when. <laughs> like, you know, it's not a matter of it's, it's when. And then AI can actually deliver messaging that humans maybe can't. And, and one of the things about behavior change is timeliness of messaging is critical. Mm -hmm. If you catch people in the act of misbehaving, if you, you catch your dog chewing your shoe, you might actually permanently change his or her behavior, right? And, and that's, machines can do that a lot better than humans can. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that you know, I'm very intrigued by this kind of whole area of, of uh, voice as a means to delivering messaging to change behavior.